Hello and welcome to this iconic cyber session, The Future of Money, where today we will be talking literally about the future of money, not just the future of the industry, the future of our role in it, but the future of the things we carry in our pockets, in our wallets and in our phones, and the rapid transformation we're seeing in this space. It is my honor to welcome you here from the studio, and I have the three most amazing people literally spanning the globe and every time zone imaginable to speak to us about what we can expect in the next 10, 20 years. So with us today, I have Bin Rutan, CEO of Southeast Asia One Connect and co-chair of blockchain, uh, the Blockchain Association of Singapore. Um, I've been meaning to meet you, Bin Ru, for a very long time. I'm super excited. And two brilliant minds and good friends that I already know, John Egan, CEO of uh, L'Atelier at BNP Paribas, and Brad Limer, co-founder of Unconventional Ventures. I feel my brain expanding every time I meet you guys, so I believe we are in for a massive treat for everyone here today. Now, we are going to be talking about the future of money, programmable money, the ethics of money. We're going to go far and wide today. But let's get started from closer to home and build our way up to it. Um, some of our audience have been wrapping their heads around programmable uh, currencies, central bank digital currencies for a while, and for some, this will be brand new. So Binro, could I turn to you first and ask you to Explain to our audience what is um, central bank issued digital currency and why should it matter to our entire industry? Thank you, Lida. It's been very nice speaking to you. Um, before I start, um, maybe a little bit of an understanding of what I do. Uh, in One Connect, we built uh, digital banks um, and uh, we're a Chinese company, HQ in uh, Shenzhen. Um, so you, we don't do cryptocurrency, uh, but then uh, the Chinese government have issued uh, renminbi digital currency. So I think uh, to us, this is this is the digital digital renminbi to a certain extent, and many people are using it uh, different in different ways. Um, so I think it, it does matter because this is going to be the changing factor going forward with the COVID situation. We do see a lot of uh, digital payments. Um, so for one connect, it's all about digital banking. Uh, but I, I think for sure payment is leading the way, uh, just like fintech, um, into changing the environment. So this is something we, we monitor very, very closely. It will impact us in many ways, I, I think, in terms of uh, how technology is going to evolve, uh, how regulations is going to address certain things. So, but I think we will take this into uh, broader conversations later on with Bradley and John. We absolutely will. And, and thank you for that. Brad, sitting on the other side of the globe, and it's probably 2 a.m. for you, um, if you had to explain to your two young boys what a central bank digital currency is, what would you say? Well, I'd, I'd probably start with the gold standard and how we got off of it in 1871 and how, you know, uh, we don't really have money uh, physically so much so more. And they'd be like, what? No, but, you know, CBDCs are a digital form of fiat currency is really all it is. And I think that of all the things that we talk about, this is sort of the most easy to understand for people. And I would highly recommend uh, Richard Turn's book, Cashless, <laughs> which is all about how China is sort of leading this way. Um, the Bank of England calls it a digital banknote as opposed to a physical banknote. So I think that's a pretty good description in the story of, you know, what it's going to mean, how it relates to all the different business models for banks and fintechs and all the crypto related businesses that are going, I think is really much deeper and more broad. So I think we're going to get into a lot of that. But what's interesting, I think, about CBDCs is that almost 90 percent of all the central banks are engaged in studying, planning or implementing these currencies. And 60 percent of those are already actively conducting experiments. They're doing proof of concept work and 20 percent are at pilot stage. So, again, Six out of 10 of all of those activities are happening in Asia. And so, you know, we need to really pay attention to what's going on in other, other markets. 100%. And we've been talking about this here at Cybos for a couple of years now. And last year, I tuned into every debate, and it was mostly about payments. And I just wasn't very excited about that. It felt like we had the shiniest of things in front of us and we were looking at something we already do fairly well. John, am I wrong? Uh, that's an interesting way to look at it, Lita. I think, like, I'm going to build on Bradley's point here, which is you know, money's been around for a long time. It is a technology in and of itself. 
it's a tool that we use to provide utility um, to rid ourselves of certain frictions when making exchanges. And it has evolved quite considerably over the centuries. And now we kind of stand on the precipice of potentially its most significant change for quite some time. But I think one of the problems we've seen over the last year when discussing this topic is that we've often discussed it from the point of view of what is now technologically feasible and not necessarily what is technologically desirable. So I think even with the conversation around central bank digital currencies, there hasn't been a great deal of conversation about um, the consequences for users. And I will get into the inclusion aspect of it soon. Um, but I think that's a really important consideration given where we exist now post 2008 that 2008 is are the are the giants hands which have molded the world that we live in today and we still very much live in the shadow of it and one of the consequences of that is the idea that there are myriad people across the world who are under the age of 40 who are finding it increasingly difficult to be socially mobile to access yield to um, to access housing and accommodation Wages have stagnated, but costs have not. Inflation has impacted certain cohorts in society far more than others. And we're having this conversation about the future of money embedded in that reality, in that context. So it should be anything but dull. It should be, it should be yes, fascinating and, and sophisticated, but it should also feel very, very real because the potential consequences of any fundamental or significant change to the nature of money having outweighed or more significant impacts on those that are most vulnerable, I think are clearly, clearly should be part of the conversation that we're having right now. And because there's many different ways in which money can go. And, and like Bradley said, or, or intimated, money at this point in time has become more notional um, than it maybe it has ever been before. It has become somewhat unmoored. And I think that's a really important consideration when we think about this. It's so much beyond just payments at this point. I'm glad you said that because I was hoping that would be your answer. Um, but the reality is you have to start from, from where you are. And as you say, we've, we looked at the art of the possible for, for a long time. We looked at what was feasible uh, and not necessarily what was desirable. And I want to come back to that for a second. But let's stay with feasibility uh, for a moment before we move to, to desirability. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, turn back to Binru, who's mentioned the, the build of the digital banks, the build of the digital capabilities. Do you, uh, Binru, see the role of the bank changing as we're going down the path of leveraging these digital capabilities? Mm, definitely. I, I think from a um, technology tech stack perspective, not to mention the impact uh, on business models, just on the technology tech stack, we do see a difference. Um, so for us, we provide uh, core banking systems to the banks. And you will find that for digital banks, uh, if uh, some digital banks do wealth management, some digital banks don't. But the, the banks, the digital banks of tomorrow, um, with considering the cryptocurrency space, uh, will need to do some level of custodian capability, some level of um, ex foreign exchange uh, or even uh, digital currency handling kind of capability. Those kind of capabilities um, are not typical in a commercial bank mm. uh, tech stack today. Uh, so definitely, I think from a technology stack, stack perspective, that's, that's definitely um, an area that will change. You will also see that many banks in um, Singapore, together with the MAS uh, in Singapore, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, embrace digital technology. Um, we MAS started issuing uh, crypto licenses. Uh, there are 170 applications for such licenses uh, since last year when it was announced. So far, two has been issued. Uh, and the, the model uh, of the traditional or conventional bank today needs to embrace uh, how crypto exchanges will work and how it's going to interact with the current bank's uh, systems. So our the largest bank in Singapore, DBS, uh, have then uh, opened up their own uh, digital crypto exchange uh, in order to start learning how to run that uh, in Singapore. Which, which opens up a very interesting conversation. If we build on what Binru just said and what Bradley was saying earlier around uh, digital currencies being essentially a digital form of the physical banknote, it does different things, um, but it's within a range of difference. But if we, if we delve deeper into 
what you've all hinted at. We are now looking at programmable money for the first time in our history, for the first time in our lifetime. Um, and I can see the inclusion angle that John hinted at, but I can also see a pretty terrifying potential angle that limits how you can spend that money, dictates how you can spend that money, and creates an if this then that rule about um, what it is you're allowed to do with your money. So um, I'll come back to John. Uh, I know I've thrown some dystopia at you, where, whereas you were going down a much more inclusive route. But let's start unpacking what programmable money means. Because as you pointed out earlier, we know that we can. The technological piece, to Bradley's point, has been is being actively pursued and unpacked. But what is possible and what is desirable isn't necessarily being matured at the same speed. So let's, let's, uh, let's get our hands dirty a little bit. Where's your head at with sure. this, John? I, I'm going to break this into the two vectors, actually, because there's, there are two groups that are possibly riskier. And one of them isn't uh, as visible, but it should be obvious, especially to the audience looking at this. And it is retail deposit takers. You know, there is an existential threat to retail deposit takers when you introduce a sophisticated central bank digital currency. I think there's there's lots of merit um, in the custodial network and for, for trade capacity and transaction banking globally. I think that it, it makes a lot of sense. And I think there's still quite clearly a role for commercial banking. But when you look at retail deposits, when, when we draw it all back, despite what we think and despite what we actually make our money, Banks are still built on this foundation of providing these very rudimentary at this point um, retail propositions and retail deposits are really threatened by central bank digital currencies because now central banks themselves um, can actually control the, the money multiplier algorithmically. So traditionally, the algorithm that existed within our, our financial network where the banks themselves, it was a mechanical Turk, me mechanical, mechanical Turk, that mechanical Turk has now been automated. It's been um, redesigned as an algorithm that, that exists within the gift of the central bank rather than the money multiplier mechanism out there in the economy. And that's a, that should be a big concern for, for deposit takers. But um, in my experience, there's not many banks out there at the moment who are considering that proposition. The other side of it, of course, the other element of potential dystopia is for the users. As soon as you begin looking at programming money, you can also program usage and you can program restrictions. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a curious thing that central bank digital currencies often get mentioned in the same sentence, or at least the same paragraph, as cryptocurrencies, when philosophically, they're at polar different ends of the spectrum. You know, one of them is about being immutable and uncensorable, a, a, a currency that can't be taken from you by a government entity. And the other one is exactly that, is a currency which can be controlled centrally by a government entity and uh, can be um, managed um, according to profile. So that is a, a really, really dystopian concern. And if you if you extend the dystopian nature of this, you know, consider uh, an environment or a society um, in which it was somewhat uh, totalitarian or, and, and and racist. Um, for instance, if we if we harken back to uh, whether that uh, an equivalent to Nazi Germany or or apartheid South Africa. Imagine a centrally controlled cryptocurrency in that environment. It could use to it could be used to exclude, to isolate, to ostracize um, as a as a fundamental mechanism of segregation in society, and uh, that is really really concerning. And uh, to the extent of my knowledge, I haven't seen any really um, successful or, or credible solutions to some of those issues that are likely to emerge. And it comes back to this notion that technology is neither good nor bad nor neutral. It, it, is the, it, is, it is within the gift of the, the creator and the users to determine that. Um, and I think that's the question that we have to answer now. And, and technology, I think, is advancing more quickly than the ethics, the morality, and the principles which should underpin it are. 100%, and I, I would lie to you if I told you I don't find it mildly terrifying, um, especially because as we're talking about the art of the possible, we aren't necessarily talking about that ethical implication as much as we need to. Um, and I'd like, dystopian as it is, I'd like to stay with it because um, you touched on two areas there, John. One is, how do we prevent this from happening? How do we become alert and awake to the possibility that it might happen and that a regime that seems benign and, and all cuddly now might actually turn and those capabilities uh, become a weapon in, in the hands of an illiberal regime. But also, who is empowered to think about this? Um, and are our 
regulatory and policy making bodies as they stand today empowered? Do they know they're empowered? Are they willing and able? Um, Brad, I'm going to turn to you with, with, those, um, with those two light and small questions. Yeah, yeah, the, the dystopian angle, this, this is good. I mean, it, you know, like everything else and all the problems that we face in modern society around algorithms controlling our lives and our data it depends on who's doing the programming and what bias they have. Uh, in some ways, though, you know, money's already programmed. Assets are already tokenized. Uh, and the value exchange between what we earn and what we spend is very much a systemic part of our society and part of our community values. So uh, I don't really know how all of this is going to shake out in terms of how the central bank is going to be involved, you know, how putting money into smart contracts are going to improve our lives. The, the challenge we're going to have is, you know, like John was saying, what happens when parameters are um, sort of a little bit on the more dystopian side? What happens when we define value where it's not consistent across a community? Um, what happens when, you know, wages are put into a blacklist or a whitelist? Uh, and imagine that you can't get your paycheck, you know, because you haven't done something like, you know, done, done enough um, packages in your shift at Amazon or how people are experiencing the vaccination being tied to money now in some ways. So you, you can have um, a utopian um, way of looking at this, meaning, yay, there's centralized control. More people could be having access into the system or dystopian. Oh, no, we're the ones being controlled. My challenge isn't so much on CBDCs. It's going to be when we talk about stable coins and we talk about tokenization of sort of almost private money. Because I think when we talk about privatizing things, what's happening is that everything that sort of becomes decentralized eventually becomes recentralized and then monetized. And that's whether it's a technology platform, a government backed digital coin, some sort of token, some other form of embedded finance. My challenge here in looking at all of this and everything that happens is that this isn't, you know, what is is changing the nature of the game. I think that um, the tokenized money, CBDCs, and stablecoins aren't going to be the story of inclusion because the incentives are all wrong. I think they're more about control and extraction and continuation of a business model that is very much lost on serving the needs of the entire community. So to me, you know, the biggest story of inclusion in the past decade has been the rise of low-cost payments and microcredits and remittance and networks like M-Pesa and Remitly and Wise. It's been the super app. It's been the expansion of the QR code and the massive networks with Tencent and Ant and Gojek and Grab, these are the things that have improved inclusion. These are the things that give me hope that to me, you know, have that inclusion aspect to the story. And that's the, you know, sort of positive side. Uh, but there's still, you know, 1.7 billion people that are unbanked. But the reason why that's right. improved isn't because of stable coins. And I, I want to come back to, to stable coins in a second. Uh, but what I want to do f first is pause and look at that inclusion angle, because I know, Binru, the work you're doing and the, the space you're in, you, you are a firm believer in the upside. I mean, we will go back to the dystopian side in just a second. But, but let's take, take a breath and, and talk about how, in the here and now, we are seeing uh, an uptick in inclusion. Mm. I, I don't, well, so for, for what one connect does, we're pretty down to earth <laughs> with regards to our solutions. And uh, just like what Bradley uh, mentioned, I think um, digital payments, um, I mean, there, there are two motivations for cryptocurrencies overall. One is to really just uh, read uh, the bank's fees and be able to do things. Uh, or transfer money without paying a, a, with a, a large sum of fees. And I think that has done very well in terms of getting financial inclusion, having people being able to uh, do cross-border uh, payments a whole lot easier. Um, and with Southeast Asia having this wave of digital banking currency uh, licenses, new licenses that's being issued, in Singapore for the past two decades, we have not had a, a new bank license and so there are, there are that many applicants uh, when the central bank decided to issue new licenses. And then very fast follow suit, uh, Philippines, Malaysia, they're all issuing new banking licenses. So uh, for, for our job, it's very down to earth where there is a value and it really brings along uh, people who are unbanked um, 
enjoying a benefit. Where crypto comes into play, there is enjoyment of a speculative nature. And I think um, the younger generation uh, has a different mindset from the, from the middle age, I would think. Uh, and I think John mentioned uh, the retail deposits might go away. Um, for banking licenses, there is a very big capital uh, payment that needs to be paid for retail licenses. And if this retail deposits goes away, the entire retail lending space uh, so for one connect, we do lending business. Uh, we build loan origination systems for digital banks, and that entire business model might change. Um, so I, I do think it will progress in two different ways. Central bank CBDC and stable coins are somewhat more down to earth, I would think. <laughs> Less spec, it removes the speculative part of the uh, equation, which I think uh, under a controlled environment will grow. Just like any other technology, you grow it. Uh, and then at, at some point, govern it uh, to come down to a stable uh, situation. I, I would think that will be the case. I like the description of, of, of them being more down to earth technologies, and I think that there's a lot of uh, <laughs> there's a lot of resonance in what you're describing. That they are they're there, they're tried, they're tested, they're being worked through. Um, what what isn't down to earth necessarily is my fear of what could be. But I do want us to stay with. Um, with the, the, the conversations we've all touched on. These technologies are rapidly maturing. The people that are playing around with the technologies are not necessarily ethical philosophers. They don't have the ability or interest to go down this path. Um, but we've all brought into light the, the challenges of what could happen because it will be technically possible. So given that we are in a rapidly changing environment, um, John, I'll, I'll turn to you. How do you see where do you see the ethical question living? If we're in a world of digitally issued central bank and currencies, private money, as Brad rightly described them, um, where does the ethical debate take place other than in this room? Who gets to decide the art of the possible and who should? Okay, so I'll try, I'll try and build off Binru and Bradley's point and, and conclude on that then. So, I think on what Binru was saying and the point of inclusion, we in the industry, we tend to think of inclusion as allowing people who would be defined as kind of the global poor to access banking. But there are more, inclusion is more sophisticated than that, it's more complex. There's a really genuine you know, problem at the moment about yield inclusion. The majority of people out there who have, like in the developed world, who have done the, uh, you know, gone to university, get a good job, work very hard, they're not included in you know, asset yields at the moment. They're not, they're, most of them can't afford a home. They certainly can't afford, afford the types of um, assets that provide yields in excess of kind of 7, 8, 9% that are accessible to the very wealthy. Now, when you add new technology to anything, you're effectively creating a dividing line that makes something less inclusive because anybody who either doesn't have access to that technology or isn't able to use it is now excluded. So there is an exclusion conversation that needs to be had with this as well. But it's all being driven by this notion of like this, it is the all powerful wand to control money and the money supply that um, completely is, is a gift beyond any power that has ever been bequeathed to any government. And we've created in, in the developed world across a myriad of different types of political formats, we've created these, uh, these propositions that limit power, that restrict power in different ways. And effectively do that to make sure that nobody um, does things that are you know, outrageous or to the kind of fundamental detriment of the citizenry. But now with this, the evolution of this new technology's new capacity, we're effectively providing the power for um, a, a government to say, well, anybody who's um, a registered voter of this party, well, their money's not going to work today. So if they want to go and vote... They're not going to be able to, you know, charge their car, fill their car. They're not going to be able to get through tolls because their money won't work. So their ability to go and vote is going to be highly restricted. And we've seen this be attempted across so many countries, even over the last number of years, it's well documented in very well developed countries, how we've seen voter restriction techniques being used, especially against uh, racial minorities in certain areas. Now, imagine if you added the capacity to control money supply directly to those people with no clear sense of auditor transparency controls. And I think it's fully beyond us at this point to try and regulate that effectively at the same rate in which technology is evolving. 
The other side to that, though, is it does exist on a spectrum. And you could imagine with a centrally issued currency, you could create the most spectacularly efficient social welfare infrastructure, ones that target individuals and help to lift them up and propel them up the social ladder in a really effective way, in a way that, that nobody gets left behind. You could target kids who are in vulnerable areas and make sure they have an equal chance. So there is a utopian version of this as well. But the problem is we just don't trust the administrators of any great power to execute it in a way that facilitates the uplift of those who are without a real voice. So I think that this is a genuine threat at the moment, is that we have, we're on the verge or the precipice of this significant capacity, this great power that has never been issued to any government administration before. And we are bereft of the controls and parameters necessary to restrict or audit that power in real time. And what good is it if we look back two or three years whence at, at the act that's happened and realize that a crime has been done? At that point, it's too late. And that is one of the regulatory issues that we have to deal with at the moment is that regulation increasingly needs to happen in live time. It can't be as, as retrospective as it has traditionally been. And that is a real challenge. And, and to my mind, it's not something that is currently resolvable. I was hoping you would end up on a higher note than that. Um, <laughs> compelling, John, and, and I, I can't find myself disagreeing with anything uh, you said, sadly. Um, I have a million questions, but I'm... Uh, although I couldn't see his face, I'm guessing Brad has a thing or two to say to that. I just, you know, I, I, I think about this, and, and there, there is... There, there's a two sides, you know, positive, negative to this. Um, I, I, I think that all of this is a, an element of control. You know, every, every single player that's involved in the crypto space, every single player that's involved in building a digital currency, the reaction to build a central bank digital currency is because people are, are afraid of losing control of the monetary system. And I think that there are more negatives to people having private control of money in private control of assets in a way um, that would be more derogatory to the long-term sort of health uh, to humanity. So, you know, when, when we have this week, you know, the, the head of the largest bank here in the U.S. saying that Bitcoin is worthless, well, you know, Jamie Dimon is going to have a lot of crypto bros to uh, slam him for that. So <laughs> my, my issue with, with all of this is that regardless of the end story here, this is evolving at such a rapid pace pace. You know, we have hundreds of billions of dollars the last 15 years that have gone into digital, digital assets of different kinds. And my question is, you know, how are we going to control that when you can't control that? You know, everything, again, I said it earlier, everything that's decentralized becomes controlled and re-centralized and monetized. So how are we going to regulate it all? You know, I think our regulators do a pretty good job. They do a pretty good job with knowing who's doing these transactions. And even, you know, in, in my days at something there, we invested in a company that unfolds every single, you know, cryptic um, way that you could potentially hide money. There's no way to hide identity. There's no way to not have money being controlled by someone. Um, so, you know, where are the ethics coming in in a world where we have 800 million people that live on less than $1.90 US a day? Uh, there's an awful lot of work we need to do, and there's an awful lot of conversation that's going to continue. But the industry needs to respond. That, that's my biggest challenge here is that they need to embrace the fact that this is happening and really be part of that conversation because the likes of Tether, the likes of Diem, the like of all these different either stable coins or you know, the, the massive amounts, the trillions of dollars that are now flowing through all these different um, crypto landscapes, that's not going to go away. It's not going to go away and, and we're not going to go far from it because it's fundamentally what our, our listeners and our audiences here at Cybers are wondering is what learning do I have to do? What choices do I have to make? What choices are being made for me? So I do want us to come back to this in a second. But first, I want to pause because um, we have brought to life uh, a very rapid maturation of technologies that allow us for public money and private money in a way that we haven't had in a, since the feudal times. Um, what we haven't talked about is the scope and possibility 
for the value represented by those tokens to be something completely different. Not the gold standard that, that Bradley mentioned at the beginning of this session, but something different. Um, yesterday in the tribal session, we heard about the possibility of, of exchanging units of value for access to clean air. Um, and during our prep, John, who I'll turn to now, uh, talked about the possibility of having a currency where the value is essentially environmental credit. So before we go back to the mechanics of regulation and the realities of where we are, can we take a moment and reflect on the art of the possible that isn't necessarily being explored, that would allow us to turn into items of exchange, things of value that have nothing to do with money as we understand it. Uh, John, do you want to build it out for us? Yeah, sure. I, I think that you know, one interesting way to consider technology is to think of it as a limitation. You know, technology is the limitation that restricts us from achieving everything we can imagine. And one of the great limitations to technology is energy. You know, the limitations of energy restricts our ability to develop a technology. And to that end, I, I think that the idea of experimenting short of nuclear fusion being created and, and, um, uh, and available to the masses, the idea of creating more reserved monetary instruments that are linked to resources like energy, especially as people begin to construct and deploy energy across microgrids and local grids. We have more and more homes producing excesses of energy and selling it back to the grids already. So it is intuitive. Um, it's, uh, it, is, it is rare. It is needed. Um, and at the moment, even more so. So we see it has that market fluctuation that, that suggests that it, it is not... Um, it is it's not ubiquitous, um, so it does have value and it doesn't travel very far. So the the notion of creating an energy backed unit of account, for instance, is a really interesting kind of speculation on what is possible. I think the environmental backed currencies are going to be really curious. This idea of it being linked linked to clean water, linked to clean air, for instance, in the future, it brings us back into the realm of the dystopian. Um, uh, so maybe we'll we'll tiptoe around it carefully. But I certainly think that a lot of the signals we've seen since 2008 show us that traditional monetary economics is not really working the way it was designed. That to go for over 10 years and looking like the next 10 years with extraordinarily low, like all-time low interest rates for a prolonged period of time with the market having no real measure of risk is um, is a, a significant undermining of the system that was built to facilitate the money the money supply, and I think what we're seeing now are these signals. Um, the cryptocurrency space is, in some some extent, a signal of people's dissatisfaction with that arrangement. So I do expect that we'll begin to see more reserved currencies, and to some extent, you know, stable coins are are evidence of that as well. Uh, a fully reserved cryptocurrency, well, allegedly fully reserved cryptocurrency is maybe um, an unsophisticated rudimentary first step to this notion of using more speculative resources to uh, reserve units of account. And, and to my mind, I think energy is probably the most likely one. Not that it will work independently of everything else or uniquely. I think we're now entering a time where uh, some composite of public money, private money, and, and new reserve money is going to be reasonably um, common. Like data is another one, for instance, that that in some ways could be structured, have liquid markets uh, measured to the extent that it could be used to reserve um, units of account. So I suspect in the next 20, 30 years, and I'm very conscious saying this, that in the 1970s, Forbes predicted that in the next decade, um, the world would turn to electric money. Um, the conversation we're now having. So this was a conversation that was being had in the 70s. So 50 years later, here we are talking about the world going cashless. But I, in the next 20 years or so, I suspect that we'll see it become more and more common for people to hold a collection of brand-related currencies, public currencies, private currencies, um, uh, uh, reserve currencies like energy, units of energy, and data-based currencies as well. Um, as common and creating liquidity mechanisms to make sure that there is an exchange between that. And that probably requires some form of stablecoin. So maybe the role that digital banking central currencies play in the future is the stablecoin mechanism that, that allows for a seamless transition between, about, between all those wallets. From, from all that uh, the three of you have talked about, and we could be here all day and still not cover everything, and, and you're doing an amazing job bringing it all to life, 
It sounds that there are certain pieces of the puzzle that are inevitable. The technology is well in train. The digitization of banking services is well in train. People will continue playing with the art of the possible. The regulators are coming to the table. Uh, the realization that we need to do this in real time and not retrospectively is maturing. It also sounds like um, utopia and dystopia are equ equally likely to occur at this point. Um, and it all depends on the choices we make um, and what, what occurs where. And what we have seen, if anything, in, in the banking industry over the last few decades is that a lot of the art of the possible is explored in an experimental manner by mathematicians and engineers who don't necessarily stop to think about how it plays out, um, what is mathematically possible and what impact it will have on the world economy isn't necessarily as closely linked. The good news is we as an industry are actually asking the questions. The bad news is we don't know what uh, series of the choices we will need to make will come at. But let's bring it a bit closer to home as we're coming close to the end of our session. Um, this is, as we have already highlighted, in train. It is maturing. Digitization is rapidly becoming the norm. And, and the, the central bank issued currencies are also becoming a thing that will be part of our everyday life soon. And Asia is very much leading the charge here. So as I go around our speakers, um, Peter, if I can come to you first, what could we realistically expect to see in the next year or two? Not utopia or dystopia, but the reality of the things that are being worked on. Uh, next year, when we all get together for cybers, how can we expect the needle to have moved? What are you seeing? Mm, next year or two, I, I think for something that has been spoken about for the past decades, it is uh, going to still move slowly. Uh, for, for Singapore, we are seeing that in the last two years, uh, it's tremendous growth of both fintech companies, blockchain companies, and a whole lot of crypto exchanges. Uh, coming up and like like the way that the central bank in Singapore has always done uh, let's not kill the innovation or govern too early but at some point it will come down to governance I do think that in the next two years you will see um, a little bit more heavy-handed governance coming down so that it comes down to a few uh, crypto exchanges uh, that would be more secured uh, be able to do their AML well so that uh, confidence uh, will grow. Uh, at this moment, we're just seeing a lot of crazy ideas and it's just proliferating all over. Uh, so uh, stable coins, I think, for energy or ESG-related uh, solves a real pain point. It's a purposeful investment and I think that, that probably will, will kick off in the next two years. Fantastic. I, I never thought I'd say this, but more governance... Uh... Makes, makes absolute sense and it would be most welcome. What about you, Brad? What do you think we should expect to see and what choices should we be looking to make in this space? Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to see an awful lot more of experimentation with um, CBDCs. I think uh, more governments will see the benefits of being able to um, have government to consumer payments, um, facilitate, you know, uh, direct to business payments, as as we've seen, you know, there's been a struggle the last couple of years of getting those benefits, especially to small businesses. Um, so there, there's an awful lot of good things that can happen when you digitize money. There's an awful lot of bad things, and so I do think, um, and I would agree with Benner that there's going to be more regulation. And I do see finally, you know, the U.S. perhaps leading in an area where they're going to actually, you know, based on probably banks and others uh, pressuring via lobbying. A little bit more control on both the crypto markets and how they um, are regulated, but also what they can do and how far they could go uh, with something like a DM. Uh, I think there's a reason why you've seen a lot of these things fail, and you've seen a lot of tech companies, especially, fail in this space um, when they try to digitize too much. Is that we don't have the trust in them, and I think that's the one thing that both our industry that we've been in for so long and our centralized governments have is, is still that bit of trust that goes beyond um, some of the people developing these digitized currencies. And so, you know, I think more regulation and I think a lot more experimentation, we're going to see it. That's a, that's a version of the future I can I could definitely believe in. Uh, John, as we're coming to the close, my, my last question to you. You sit in that um, unique space outside a traditional institution, but in so many ways tasked with uh, translating the future for them. 
you may not have been asked the question, it's, it's more hypothetical than, than practical. But as we are facing into the next few years and experimentation and regulation will, will start speeding up, um, what's the question that you would ask the incumbents to think of that they may not be thinking about so that we don't squander the choices we do get to make in the years to come? Oh, I think that's interesting. I think the I have a lot of sympathy for the incumbents because it's been a very difficult 12 or 13 years for the incumbents. And in, in many ways, um, we've seen over that period of time, a lot of the, the great talent that used to come to incum incumbent banking institutions are now, are now going to technology companies. So it's been a much more competitive environment for talent. Um, and also a lot of the people who would have been young middle managers in 2008, we're now moving into senior management, have only ever really known a defensive posture um, and, and, and don't have any familiarity with, with, with incumbents being, financial incumbents being aggressive. And I think that's something which banks need to learn to do again in a low, in, in a low yield environment that's unlikely to change. And it's likely that we're going to see more inflation and much more currency volatility because of the, the geopolitical landscape as well in a context where younger audiences continue to detach themselves from traditional finance in a meaningful way because they don't believe they can ever afford a home. And if you can't afford a home, then why do you need a bank if you're never going to buy one? So I do think that we're going to see a significant continued increase in these kind of metaverse oriented propositions from new players. I think we're still quite a long way away from the likes of a Facebook or Google or Apple, et cetera, creating a proposition which is centralized and effective. Um, it will inevitably happen, but not in the next 12 to 24 months. But for now, I think banks, it, it, in banking, you never need to move extremely fast. It's not prudent or responsible to do so, but you need to be taking incremental steps to explore all new possibilities and all new opportunities. And I think over the next 12 months, banks need to put themselves our incumbents more generally to put themselves in a position where they can make decisions. And I think in my experience, the majority, certainly in the, in, in the US and Europe anyway, are not in a position where they can make effective decisions yet. And that should be the objective, not to roll anything out or not to change the world, just to be able to make an informed decision. That requires experimentation, it requires research, analysis, um, the solicitation of new talent, all of that is required and it doesn't currently exist. And in hand in hand with regulators and, and governance as well. In so many ways, what we've heard today chimes with what we've been hearing and saying here at Cybos in our own offices at Inner Tribe year after year for the last decade, decade and a half. The world is changing, digital is the only way. Money is changing, banking is changing, regulation will need to change around it. Innovation is required, rules of the road are required. Decisions are required. In so many ways, what we heard today resonates. And in so many ways, it is brand new and slightly daunting because as we're hearing again and again, the work that everyone is doing is now finally coming to that point of acceleration. These things are not new. We've been talking about them for a while. But as Binru said, as, as Brad said, as John said, we are coming to an inflection point. Things are speeding up. Things are maturing decisions and commitments will need to be made to make sure that we go towards the utopia and not the dystopia. Uh, the most fascinating session. Thank you so much to all three of you and to everyone who tuned in to listen to us. Sadly, time does fly when you have amazing conversations, but the future of money is here every year. The world is moving fast and we'll be back with our eyes always firmly set on the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>